In this video, we're going to be talking about hydronic heating and some of the common components that you're going to find on hydronic heating systems. As we go through this, realize we are going to spend in future videos a little bit more time on each of the components, but this is more of an overview. So hydronic heating systems rely on circulating water or steam to deliver heat to the remote locations where warming of the space is desired. So we have a source of heat, we have a pump, and we have different zones that's referenced in this, okay? Source of heat could be any type of boiler, okay? Gas, electric, oil, okay? Sometimes it's even geothermal, but we'll talk more about that in another area of this program. So we have a circulator pump and we have zones, okay? This is a parallel system. Sometimes you have zone radiator after radiator after radiator, okay? This is an example of one such hydronic heating system. You'll see the circulator on the right-hand side here. You have an expansion tank. You have our controls, which we'll talk more about. We have an oil burner, and we have an indirect hot water tank off here to the side. This is actually a pretty neat install. The more valves you have on an install, the better the installation was because it allows you to isolate parts of the system. Heat energy is transferred from the heat source, that's the burners, to the water in the boilers. We have two different types of boilers on the market today. We have what's considered a high mass boiler and a low mass boiler. Okay, the cast iron boiler, which is a high mass boiler, are the most commonly found boiler in residential applications. Now that's changing over time, okay? And we'll talk more about the low mass or the high efficiency boilers. But the residential cast iron boilers typically hold between 10 to 15 gallons of water. This is an example of a cast iron high mass boiler. While McLean is actually a pretty good brand and you see these around a lot. But they do hold a lot of water. Now this comes into play with efficiency because from a cold start, in other words, the water is cold. It takes a lot of fuel to heat that water to a temperature where it will actually heat or cool, heat the space you're wanting to heat. The heat source, again, the low mass boilers, which would be like stainless steel boilers, are gaining popularity due to the higher efficiencies. Low mass boilers only hold between four to seven gallons of water. Now, again, the biggest difference here is the amount of time and energy that it takes to heat from a cold start to the temperature you need in your radiators or heat distribution system. This is an example of a low mass boiler. It's a little munchkin boiler sitting on the ground. It's small boiler, very efficient. Okay, and it's high efficiency. You can tell by the um, vent pipes or the exhaust, which is PVC. Okay, now some of these now are designed to hang on the wall. Okay, you have wall hung boilers as well. So the Core control of the entire system, the, what starts it and stops it, okay, is the heating thermostat. It could be digital, could be snap action, could be a mercury bulb. Okay, it's a close on temperature drop device. In other words, the switch inside of it closes the circuit as the temperature drops below the set point. And this is just a couple of the different thermostat types, digital, snap action, mercury bulb. You're not seeing many mercury bulbs around anymore. So if you pop the top on one that looks like this, don't be surprised if you see electronics in there. The next step is the aquastat. The aquastat is a temperature sensing switch and that is what's responsible for cycling the boiler on and off to keep the water in the boiler close to the desired temperature. It could be strapped onto a pipe or it can even be immersed in the water via a well or an access point on the boiler itself. A couple different aquastat types and again we're going to talk more about this in depth. This is just an overview. You have an immersion type. Okay, this screws into the boiler. This is a strap-on. Okay, straps onto a pipe using clamps. And this is a triple aquastat. This by far is the most frequently found one now because of the functionality. Every boiler has to have a low water cutoff. It's part of building code. The low water cutoff is responsible for shutting down or de-energizing the boiler in the event the water level in the system falls below the desired levels. 
The low water cutoff is a safety device that most code officials require to be installed on all hydronic systems. The world's worst thing would be to energize a boiler that doesn't have water in it. It's why boilers used to explode before they started to have low water cutoffs. You'll see a low water cutoff. A lot of times they're here in a pipe. They're actually immersed in the pipe. Okay, they're sensing that there's water in the system. Okay, if this doesn't have water, it's very likely there's been a leak and the boilers run dry. Okay, so the low water cutoff has to de-energize and it's very important that the operation of this be checked every time you go service a boiler. You also have high limit switches, manual reset. High limit switches are required in light commercial applications. In other words, if the temperature of the boiler gets too high, it needs to cut off and require a manual reset. Now we have other high limits that are part of the aquastats that are actually part of the operating controls. But if that high limit fails in light commercial applications, many times you have to have a second high limit reset. The circulator pump, hey, these are found on most systems. The circulator pump is used to move the water through the hydronic system. The circulator pump is also called a centrifugal pump. The centrifugal pump is made up of a low motor, a linkage, and an impeller. Okay, there's several different circulator styles and brands, and there's also larger pumps. The Taiko 007, the Taiko 110, and the Grunfoss three-speed pumps are the most frequently found one, with the Taiko 007 still being the primary one you see in most residential applications. Circulator pump panels, like switching relay, control the operation of the multiple pumps at one time. A thermostat located in each space to be heated calls for heat, and the zone panel turns on the correct circulator for that space. Now, there's other configurations as well where we might have zone valves rather than circulators. This is just happens to be an example of a Taiko zoning control. Every one of these sw switches is wired in here and controls one of the circulators that sends water to and from a zone. Again, this is a really nice installation. Okay, properly wired. You can um, de-energize every single circulator individually without uh, de-energizing the rest of the system in case you need to make repairs. And you see on over here in this example, there's valves above and below each circulator along with some pretty nice temperature gauges. Don't see that very often, but that's always nice to see. Zone valves are sometimes used to allow or disallow water from flowing through a system. Zone valves they are either controlled by a thermostat or by a zone panel. Okay, there's several different zone valves around. You have the Taiko, you have the Honeywell, and you have the B&G. Okay, e each one of these does the same thing. Thermostat calls for heat, the zone valve opens, and allows the circulator to run to send water through this appropriate space. A cutaway picture of a zone valve shows the connections inside of it. So you have a little heat motor up here. This actually pulls the plunger up or actually pushes it down and allows the um, water to circulate, to run through the valve. The space temperature is, comes back to its set point. Thermostat opens, de-energizing the heat motor. The spring pushes the valve back closed and the water stops. And of course, there's some switching that goes on here between these pins, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about zone valves in detail. Zone valves can also be controlled by a panel, much like the circulator pumps. You see this more and more, zone valves being controlled by panels. It's much easier to wire, and it's much easier to troubleshoot. Then we also have some non-electrical components that are found on most hydronic systems. We have expansion tanks. There's two types of expansion tanks, a standard expansion tank. It's nothing more than a large tank located someplace above the boiler. And then we have diaphragm expansion tank. It's divided into two sections separated by a rubber semi-permeable membrane. One side of the tank contains air. The other side is open to the water circuit. So what's the purpose of the expansion tank? Again, 
hot wa water expands when it's hot. Okay, if we didn't have an expansion tank, the water would get to such a high pressure that it would actually have to come out of the system someplace. It would probably blow the safety valve and allow water onto the floor, or it would blow apart a section of pipe. So as water heats, it expands. By having an expansion tank, there's room for this water to expand. Now, the most frequent one seen these days is the diaphragm expansion tanks. You don't see much of the standard expansion tanks except in heavy commercial applications and very old systems. This is an example of a diaphragm expansion tank with an air scoop and a vent. Okay, the water is actually in the top portion of the tank. You can almost see where the bladder or the diaphragm is going to be inside of here. So anything above this joint is water. Anything below this is air. So one of the ways to troubleshoot these tanks and make sure that that diaphragm hasn't burst is tap a screwdriver on the bottom here. Should sound hollow. Tap a screwdriver on the top here. It should sound solid. Okay, if this is solid and has one sound all the way through, your expansion tank bladder has busted and you do have to replace the expansion tank. There is a fitting here at the bottom. There's a Schrader valve here at the bottom, okay? And the reason for that Schrader valve is simple. It's so that we can adjust the pressure. And we're going to talk more about that when we talk about expansion tanks. The air scoop, the air scoop is very simple. Water flows through in the direction of the arrow. That's critical. Air gets pulled out of the water, okay? And gets sent out through the um automatic air bleed up here. Okay, we're gonna, again, that we'll talk about more in detail. Automatic water feeds are required in all hydronic systems. It maintains a preset water pressure in the system. If the pressure drops too low, it slightly opens up and allows new water to enter the system. This makes sure that along with the high limit or the the um, cutoff, the low water cutoff, it makes sure that the water will always remain in the system. Now, any time we have a boiler and we have an automatic water feed connected to domestic water lines, we have to have a backflow preventer. Okay, The backflow preventer only allows water flow in one direction. In most states, anything after on the boiler side of the black flow prevention can be handled by an HVAC technician or boiler technician. Anything from the back flow preventer back to the water lines is the territory of the plumbers. Okay, so be very careful and know the codes of what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do in the states. And in some states, this includes homeowners. When there's a back flow situation, there's many states where it has to be inspected and it has to be done by a licensed plumber. Watch the arrows. They only work in one direction. It's very important. The pressure reducing valve automatically drops the pressure of the water entering the structure to the pressure at which the boiler is designed to operate. It's usually only required when supply water pressure exceeds the boiler manufacturing specifications. Boilers operate between 12 and 15 PSI of water. Your building pressures are normally between 60 and 100 PSI, so we have to have a pressure reducing valve. And this is just one example of a pressure reducing valve. The screw at the top allows you to adjust it to the pressure you need for the boiler. And again, watch the arrows. Anytime there's an arrow, that is the direction the water must flow. Pressure relief valves are designed to open if the pressure in the system release reaches a set point on the valve. This is the most important safety device installed on a hydronic system. And these are also required on anything that you use to heat water. Okay, hot water heaters must have them. They're different pressures. Boilers must have them. They are absolutely required on every hydronic system that's used to heat water. You must have a pressure relief valve. This is to an example of a pressure relief valve. Okay, this one will open at 30 psi, and I can't see the set point over here. It's probably the same. It actually looks like the same one, 
but they can be different settings. The ones on hot water heaters, will all, they're actually also temperature driven. Okay, so it's a combination of pressure and temperature, and they're usually a little bit higher pressure wise. So just be aware that there must be a pressure relief valve. I was out on a boiler that I was on a hot water system that I was inspecting. It was a um, instant hot water system, and we didn't know what was wrong with it. And by the time I got to the breaker panel to turn it on, it was electric, and got back to it, it had actually blown the piping apart because somebody installed it without a hot without a pressure relief valve, and the pressures in the system got way too high. The flow control valves control the flow in a hydronic system. They're also called check valves. We only want water to go in one direction. Okay, in a hydronic system, a lot of times, hot water rises, cold water fail, falls. So if you don't have a check valve and flow control valves, it's very possible that you're gonna start heating an area of the building or devices that you don't wanna heat just by gravity. Okay, so these are two different types of flow control or check valves. The one on the left is brass. That can be used in domestic water. Okay, water that's going to be dr able to be drinkable. The one on the right is cast iron. That cannot be used in any water that could come out of a faucet or people could consume. Remember, water is a food. Okay, and it can get contaminated by rust and other contaminants. So be very careful where you use these things. The brass ones are slightly more expensive. I always use them in just about everything. Balancing valves are used to even out the water flow through each branch of a circuit. Balancing valves are installed at each branch of the circuit and can be manually adjusted. You normally see balancing valves in commercial applications or sometimes in large apartment buildings that share a common water system or a hotel. Okay, it actually allows you to set the pressures and the flow rate in gallons per minute to an exact number. Okay, you, can, uh, you attach a balancing gauge here and here, and you adjust this by, and by knowing the diameter of the pipe, the pressure in and out, you can actually tell exactly how much the water flow is through a specific part of the system. Once you set it, you mark it so that people know exactly where the pointer was in case it has to be replaced. So those are just the basic components of a hydronic system. There's a ton more that we're going to go through. But again, this is just an overview.